What up, cool kids? Quick reminder that we have social media, so check out Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebooks. Hooray! Everything is meaningless! Excuse me, but is this really the best we could do? I've said it before, and by gum I'll say it again. I have a real soft spot for supposedly dumb films. Give me your Tom Greens, your 90s action romps, and your high-concept nonsense, and I'll drink them up quicker than Daniel Day-Lewis' metaphorical milkshake. I drink it up! To butcher the great bard himself, if Bergman be the food of love, panoramic detonations are a greasy snack between meals. When we refer to a particular film as dumb, we're often calling attention to the inaccurate and the outlandish. If you think about that for even a cursory second, this distinction becomes increasingly arbitrary. On a granular level, any art that doesn't adhere to strict realist conventions is dumb in the face of our waking lives. Why do we lambast robots punching robots, but elevate a series about bacterially possessed space wizards? It's a curious contradiction. I have all the time in the world for these so-called lesser works where escapism and suspension of disbelief supersede the fundamentals of interaction and probability. Too often, though, dumb gets conflated with an entirely different meaning. Bad. In this strange world where we relegate the lowbrow to incessant mockery, what exactly makes a film smart? A sound internal logic? Scientific and or historical accuracy? Believable characters acting realistically? Or how about artistically and intellectually challenging material? I adore all those films and commend any work for going the extra mile to stimulate discourse based on tangible, relatable conventions. But there are many delightful ways we can appreciate works that may not stick to the confines of reality, realism, or even the most generous definition of believable. Poetic genius and complete shite-hawk of a human being, Charles Bukowski once said, An intellectual says a simple thing in a hard way, an artist says a hard thing in a simple way. When it comes to stripped-back simplicity, Battle Los Angeles is a Marie Kondo exercise in tossing out anything that could be considered remotely taxing. The dialogue is grunts, growls, and dial a cliché soldier speak, while action scenes are shot with the kinetic finesse of a piss-drunk hummingbird. What it's got going for it is the candour of its conceit, and how it manages to smuggle intellectually robust contemplations into what is essentially a drab fireworks display. What If Black Hawk Down Was Ambushed in the Open by War of the Worlds is as good a high-concept pitch as any to hang a film on, and it isn't taking its audience knowledge for granted when it comes to the genres it's playing with. Exposition is kept to the bare minimum. After all, why tell the audience about an invasion when you can show them the impact from street level? Most of the information we gleam about the alien combatants is omitted to background noise. Our core cast of soldiers are focused on their role, not the significance of the event itself. Rather than getting bogged down in the who, hows, and whys, Battle Los Angeles is almost entirely propelled by the where and when. These are soldiers, going where they're told, and doing their job. If you want to delve past the unintelligible action beats, there's an in no way subtle but still appreciated commentary running throughout. Shot and set during a time of ongoing American military intervention, having the aliens inflicting massive damage with superior technology in order to exploit natural resources and destabilize a region is appreciatively blunt. It could also be viewed as a somewhat ironic retelling of the founding of the United States, where an invading force emerges from the ocean to exterminate a native populace. Aside from this admittedly ham-fisted commentary, Battle Los Angeles features one seemingly insignificant shot more thought-provoking than entire feature films. An alien soldier is wounded in action only for his squadmates to tactically remove him from the fray. Whereas so many films that pit mankind against extraterrestrial terrors depict the antagonistic force as a mindless swarm, with one simple gesture, Battle Los Angeles alludes to a universe of hereto unconsidered quandaries with regards to the cannon fodder of old. It forces us to evaluate our enemy as cognizant, compassionate creatures, rather than distant targets on the horizon. They're soldiers, 
going where they're told and doing their job. You think those things get scared too? They're probably just like us. I don't know if grunts that get told to go fight. With the eruptions of shrapnel, silliness and stock human characters muddying up the finished product, it's a fascinating example of a compromised work of promise sifted through a mesh screen of outright stupidity. Let's move away from Aaron Eckert's glorious chin meat and over to Aaron Eckert's stubbled up underface, as we destroy all scientific reasoning on our way to the core. In 2010, sparked by growing concerns surrounding the accuracy of science in cinema, Professor Sidney Perkowitz and the US National Academy of Scientists proposed guidelines to screenwriters of the world, including movies should be allowed only one major transgression of the laws of physics. One of the lightning rods galvanizing Perkowitz's insistence on radical change was a particular hatred for 2003's The Core. Famously inaccurate in just about every single way, the core is jubilantly, proudly dumb. At no point does it pertain to be anything other than a B-movie disaster feature, hopping on the heels of its equally ridiculous contemporaries while tipping its hat to the exploration and get-up-and-go moxie of its peers. Casting aspersions at the core for not playing by the rules of physics is far more than low-hanging fruit. It's the wet blanket ramblings of killjoy criticism that goes out of its way to forget what the phi in sci-fi actually means. Science is a selfless business, dear boy. Here we have a goofy as hell romp about an indestructible drill train built out of something called unobtainium, a gag so good Avatar stole it, unobtainium, filled with thermonuclear weapons set for the centre of the Earth. To judge this film as anything other than an adventurous flight of fancy requires an outright refusal of imagination. This isn't a case of letting the core off the hook, it's a question of why it's on the hook to begin with. For what reason do we catalogue every contrivance and stretch conceit as a failure rather than fiction? If you want to tell me some films are off limits for unironic enjoyment because they don't stand up to MIT certified scrutiny, then let's steal the time machine from Primer and go tell Jules Verne and HD Wells to fuck all the way off. I don't like the core because I believe I'm in any way intellectually enriched by it. I like the core because it's a thrill ride through molten rock with a cast of character actors trying to detonate the centre of the earth. Plus, it's got Stanley Tucci in it. Entertainment can and absolutely does enlighten our understanding of the universe, the physical and the spiritual, but that shouldn't come as a prerequisite. It's a real dumb movie, yes, but it's also exciting, funny, and a scuffed up diamond of dumbness. So with all my rambling revelry for these not so smart experiences, what makes a film too dumb? Stripped of the need to validate its own existence against the scrutiny of the serious and the scientifically minded amongst us, can an embarrassment of dumbness kill even the schlockiest of schlock? Here's a brief plot summary of The Wandering Earth. In order to escape from the sun, which is about to explode by the way, the Earth is strapped to thousands of rockets and turned into a planet-sized spaceship, hurtling through the cosmos and out of harm's way. If you're anything like me, that synopsis will have burst your pleasure centre wide open. Sadly, and it pains me to say this, dumb is just about the only endearing trait this film has. The plucky, adventurous hand-waving away of how anything in reality functions is what I come to these exploding stupid spectacles for. On paper, it has it all. The non-science of the core, the eye-candy calamity of 2012, a plot stolen from a Futurama episode. So why is The Wandering Earth not my tempo? The examples I've given so far are all bonkers, but they're consistent in their peculiarities and coherent in their own flailing, dog-eared way. The Wandering Earth is completely lacking the scaffolding of any internal logic for us to stay anchored to, and that's a real problem. Space stations explode without plot justification, the screenwriters just decided it needed to go boom, one person is flash frozen in an instant, while another is blown up, dropped off a cliff and left exposed to the same unsurvivable cold, only to walk it off like a stubbed toe. 
In a particularly gibberish sequence, the cast are transporting the fuse to re-spark one of the scuttled Earth engines, when this bumbling dingus, for reasons known to absolutely nobody, pulls out her gun and shoots it, dooming billions to die for no reason other than the script dictated that something bad probably needed to happen. What? What are you thinking? To put this in perspective, imagine if halfway through speed, Keanu Reeves yelled, logic is for fucking nerds, shot Sandra Bullock in the spinal column, and slammed the bus into a brick wall. It demands the audience relinquish any semblance of human cognition in service of a whiplash-inducing car wreck of incoherence, where we don't so much see the narrative wheels turning, rather we become acutely aware that nobody's in the driver's seat. We're not going along for the ride here, we're being dragged kicking and screaming through maddeningly poor narrative, directorial and aesthetic decisions. In the source novel, yes this is based on a real book with words and everything, many of the Earth's citizens are acutely aware of the ridiculousness of the plan to turn the planet into a man-powered asteroid. There's a rebellious underclass who firmly believe the sun is perfectly fine, and the whole Wandering Earth program is a false flag operation set in motion to quash personal liberty, enslave the working class, and claim ownership of all remaining natural resources. It provides a counterbalance to the all-for-one heroism, and addresses the 12,742 km wide elephant in the room. Not only is all of this missing from the film, it's grossly reversed. Instead, we have the noble and well-intentioned government <coughs> single-handedly leading the way towards the salvation of the planet. Now, this is in no way a problem exclusive to Chinese cinema, and to suggest as such risks cultural bias. How often have we seen the pompous chest-beating of America standing as the last bastion of hope in the free world? Regardless of geography, it's all bollocks. However, even Armageddon, with all of its Michael Bayhem, carved out enough time to question bureaucratic meddling and the military-industrial complex. What are you doing with a gun in space? Here, the only thing that doesn't freeze in Arctic tundra is the Chinese flag, and the only thing that can survive the apocalypse is patriotism. Smush this together and slather it in sleep-inducing ciphers masquerading as characters, action sequences that feel like watching Thunderbirds while drunkenly operating a forklift, and so little in the way of charm, cheese or cheerful abandon as to make the whole affair as tedious as it is tremendously dense. Not in a dumb fun way, in a remembering angels and demons when they trained dogs to smell out antimatter kind of way. The issue here isn't that I think Arnie yelling at a child about a toilet is on the same level as Mamet. It's that we operate in an ecosystem of denigration and appreciation that will quickly list off all the reasons the core is moronic and Battle Los Angeles is derivative, but selectively ignore these same issues in, oh I don't know, just about every celebrated mainstream filmmaker working today. There's a strangely hypocritical disconnect at play. The distinction we make between acceptable inaccuracies born of fun and artistic necessity, and some inherent failing of the audience collective intellect, seems selective at best, and at worst, downright snobbish. I'm not saying you can't knock a film for its nonsense. It's all a question of intent, ambition, and whether or not we gain something from our experience. If I leave the theatre laughing, smiling, or longing for fire in space, and that's worth something to me. Special shout out to our Patreon producers Jennifer C and Paul of the Pauls, and to all of our other supporters. If you'd like to see more from us, including the Infame Out Film Club, exclusive reviews and features, consider supporting us via Patreon in the link below, or sharing this video wherever you do that sort of thing. As always, thank you so much for watching, and let's have a chat in the comments. Until next time, this is In Frame Out.